Hello, uh, we will now uh, uh, look at uh, this class today on uh, discussion on uh, uh, Feynman's talk on nanotechnology. Um, as mentioned, it is uh, considered by many uh, and acknowledged by many as one of the first, if not the first uh, systematic uh, discussion on the uh, uh, idea of uh, nanotechnology, the concept of nanotechnology, the uh, uh, various issues that one might uh, see if you were to deal with this field and also the potential of this field. Uh, so, uh, in fact, even in his talk, he does not necessarily use the word nanotechnology. Uh, he simply tells you about uh, the huge potential of this uh, uh, arena of uh, small things. Um, and you know some fascinating views that we can uh, look at and uh, consider. Uh, it is particularly very informative uh, uh, because of various things uh, including uh, his ability to see so far forward in terms of uh, what, what is possible in that area and also the ability to think uh, differently from what was being done at that time. Uh, right? So, many times in science that is one of the first starting points that we are supposed to uh, look at. Uh, to look at the literature and say you know they have done all this, what can I do that is different. Um, often uh, we find many of us will find that you know we tend to look at uh, improvement in an area uh, based on the framework that already exists in that area. So, you have some framework and within that framework you are looking at some uh, uh, improvement. So, uh, it is not often easy to look at a framework that is drastically different from the, uh, from the framework itself that exists. Uh, so, in his talk that is sort of what he does, I mean uh, at that time nobody was really looking at this uh, uh, arena and uh, he was still able to uh, you know set aside the idea that most people are thinking at the macro scale and keep that aside and say now let me think at a much, much, much smaller scale and, uh, uh, and see what is possible there. So, that is a uh, you know thinking like they say in English uh, outside the box, uh, out of the box thinking, this is sort of that, this is a, a very good example of that everybody else would have sort of you know looked at what was already in place for macroscopic things and see ways of improving that and here he was uh, looking at something you know completely different from that. So, uh, we already had some discussion on uh, his ideas uh, with respect to uh, data uh, you know uh, uh, the way in which you could uh, uh, handle uh, data at a very small scale, how you could put uh, tremendous amount of information in uh, tiny spaces um, and uh, also uh, if you did that, uh, how you would uh, you know perhaps look at the computers uh, trying to uh, access that data and therefore, what issues those computers would face and what issues computers in general at that point in time were facing and how those issues uh, could potentially be overcome by looking at uh, extremely uh, miniaturized computers. Uh, both the data there, uh, the way in which the data has been miniaturized as well as the miniaturization of the computers, uh, both of those are now realities. Uh, I mean today, we carry most of us carry a laptop with us and even that may change with time, uh, but most of us ca carry a laptop which is uh, phenomenally powerful and uh, we carry huge amounts of data with us, uh, both of which were completely uh, you know uh, alien uh, to uh, society in say 1950s and 1960s. Um, and uh, uh, you know at that point in time, the best computers uh, used to used to be at least uh, a room sized uh, computer or even a building sized computer that is like the best that you could think of. So, uh, we have come a long way and uh, many of the predictions he has made in those areas have uh, come true. In today's class, uh, we will particularly look at ideas that he discussed uh, on this uh, concept of uh, small scale uh, associated with its impact on parts that you might make, uh, on stresses that might uh, exist, uh, anisotropy that is there uh, in materials. Um, which or at least an anisotropy that may end up coming up uh, more uh, dramatically in materials and then some you know um, ideas on relative values of properties uh, because again scale changes and therefore, uh, uh, you know impact of uh, relative values of properties uh, is uh, important to look at. Uh, some things on manufacturing and manipulation of uh, uh, you know parts at small scale and uh, aspects related to accuracy uh, with this uh, area. So, these are all interesting uh, points, uh, they sort of maybe relate to each other at different levels and uh, so as we discuss these uh, topics, I think some, in, uh, some aspect of interrelation of uh, interrelationship of these properties uh, is uh, of value for us to uh, sort of uh, think about. So, for example, um, we will look at two aspects of this you know precision and accuracy and so on. Um, 
uh, the point that he brings about uh, uh, brings out very nicely in his talk is that I mean or alerts us to uh, is the fact that you know if you made some some uh, component uh, you know let us say you have a cylinder uh, and uh, I know you have a piston going into the cylinder and you say uh, the gap between the cylinder and the piston is uh, uh, you know uh, point, uh, point zero zero 0.001 millimeter. So, or point yeah point zero zero 0.001 millimeter let us say you say. So, so if, if this gap is point zero zero 0.001 millimeter right. So, that is 1 micrometer. So, that is the accuracy with which you have uh, and let us say these parts are now in the in that scale let us say this is I do not know this is uh, I mean this is not drawn to scale, but you may have a, a piston which is say 10 centimeters another uh, and some other housing it is in the wall of which is uh, another say 10 centimeter. So, you are looking at two 10, cent 10 centimeter uh, objects the gap between them is uh, 0 0.001 uh, uh, millimeter. Okay, so, uh, in macroscopic scale you could ha easily have a component which looks like this. Now, if you are trying to replicate the same thing in uh, very tiny scale uh, it is important to understand that this level of uh, you know uh, accuracy with which you are building those parts uh, may not suffice if you go to the small scale. Because at the small scale if this is now only uh, say 0.1 mm and this is only 0.1 mm. Then uh, here you have gone from uh, 1000 mm part. So, 10 cent no sorry 100 mm uh, 100 mm part and uh, 0 0.001 mm gap. So, you are looking at uh, you know 5 orders of magnitude So, 5 orders of magnitude uh, uh, difference is there between the gap and the, uh, and the component. Uh, on the other hand if you have something that is 0.1 mm part and you still maintain this 0 0.001 gap so then what you will have is uh, you are you are basically seeing a difference of 0.1 to 0 0.001 so you are only looking at two orders of magnitude Okay, so, the difference between the two parts and the gap between the parts is only two orders of magnitude. So, th the point is if you you are making something in the microscopic scale which was only 0 0.001 mm accuracy and it functioned in a certain way wherein you know you had this long piston and this long uh, cylinder and things did not wobble uh, you could uh, move see it moving up and down uh, uh, uniformly. If you now go to uh, so, so you have gone from uh, uh, 10 centimeters to 0.1 uh, mm. So, 100, uh, 100 millimeter to 0.1 mm. So, you have gone down by a factor of 1000. So, you are let us say you are reducing everything by a factor of 1000. Okay, so, the size of the components has come down by a factor of 1000. So, now at that scale if your uh, uh, accuracy is still 0 0.001 mm if that is the gap that you are providing then you will find that at that scale the piston and the cylinder will have much more wobble okay so they will have much more wobble uh, given the relative scale of things and so on and uh, so if you just continue maintaining this if everything else keeps becoming smaller and smaller and smaller uh, but the gap remains the same uh, you could very well have even a situation where the component is 0 0.001 uh, mm and the gap is also 0 0.001 mm uh, it is the same as having a 10 centimeter uh, cylinder wall a 10 centimeter piston and the gap between them being 10 centimeters so, you see that uh, uh, there is a need that the, the gap should be very very tiny relative to the cylinder sizes, uh, size of the components. So, if you are just re reducing the size of the components, but you are not improving the accuracy, if you are not uh, increasing the uh, uh, accuracy with which they, they are getting closer and closer to each other, uh, then you will have a situation where the parts will wobble and uh, therefore, so that is something that you need to be alert to. It does not mean that you cannot overcome it, but it means you need to be alert to that is uh, so when you are designing. Uh, something that is going down in scale you have to keep this in mind. Uh, please also remember that uh, at the time that he gave this talk uh, many of these uh, technologies were not currently built 
and at that point not built and then uh, and therefore, uh, many of the examples that he gives has a certain uh, you know uh, association with mechanical objects that you can relate to and that is fine. I mean, uh, but that is the way he has presented it and uh, uh, he has given wide range of examples, but some of the examples tend to have this mechanical uh, frame of reference and that is how you see this uh, reference. So, when you go down in parts uh, the, the explanation he uh, the idea that he alerts you to is that your precision should also be uh, something that you need to pay attention to. Okay. Similarly, if you go extremely small in parts right. So, there also you end up having some other uh, uh, issue. Uh, so, that is also something that you have to keep in mind. If you are making a, a very small machine you know where we spoke about a scale of 1000 supposing you go to scale of uh, you know 100,000 uh, down in size. Then uh, again let us say you are putting the cylinder and wall together etcetera and let us say this is the wall of the this is the wall of the piston what you see here. So, at, at the macroscopic scale it is a nice smooth wall. So, it is a nice curved uh, wall. So, it let us say it is uh, uh, it is forming uh, uh, the uh, uh, cylinder is forming uh, if the, let us say this is the wall of the cylinder. If the cylinder is forming uh, uh, you know tubular structure cross section would be a circle and let us say this is part of that wall. The, so, you are seeing that wall and therefore, you are seeing a nice smooth curve and then the cylinder that goes inside it will also be a nice uh, the piston that goes inside it will also be a nice smooth curve. Now, the same thing if you were doing in nano scale, I mean you are going down in scale to a nanotechnology scale, then if you had a piston and a cylinder, the surface of the piston is no longer uh, you know um, uh, millions of atoms or billions of atoms, it is several individual atoms. So, then atoms of course, you can think of them in different ways, this is a rudimentary way of thinking of them as uh, hard spheres, uh, but you can think of them in, in some sense that is a picture that could still work for us. So, now even if you make a curve like this, even if you are trying to make uh, uh, the wall of a piston, a uh, wall of a cylinder, so then that wall would consist of a series of spheres like that, right. So, you will have a series of spheres. So, you see here uh, while you had a smooth surface here, you no longer have a smooth surface here, you have a surface that looks uh, that looks like this, right. So, this is the surface now you that you have. Similarly, even the piston, even the piston that is inside this. So, the piston would have been like that part of the piston we will draw here and that would continue. So, so you have a piston like that and that is the piston that is sliding in the cylinder. Here the piston itself would also consist of uh, uh, atoms and so the piston itself would have this kind of a shape. So, you have a bunch of atoms, most importantly the surface, surface of that uh, piston. So, the uh, surface of the piston would then also be like that. So, you can uh, immediately see that what was a pair of uh, uh, you know smooth surfaces here is no longer a pair of smooth surfaces here, right. So, so, this is something that we have to pay attention to when we go into the uh, nano scale and uh, uh, because that makes a difference on how well the two parts uh, will now behave with respect to each other. So, that is something that we need to uh, keep in mind th and uh, relative to the scale. We also discussed in the last class uh, the other issue with respect to sizes and which is about the stress. Uh, in this case the uh, it is no longer an issue for us uh, in the sense that uh, you can see we discussed in uh, detail last class that when you go from a large elephant and you make it a small elephant as long as you proportionally bring everything down in size, the stresses uh, faced by uh, let us say the bones of the small elephant is actually vastly less than the stresses faced by the bones of the large elephant. And that is got to do with the fact that uh, as the size increases the volume increases as cube of the size uh, whereas the area increases only as the square of the size. So, if you are going from small to big uh, the weight goes up fast the uh, area that is holding the weight goes up slowly and therefore, the stress on that same area is higher. Opposite direction you go you are going in a favorable direction because weight is decreasing faster when you go from large to small, but the area is decre decreasing 
relatively slower. It is decreasing uh, as square of the value of the uh, length that is decreasing as cube of the value of the length and therefore the stresses are uh, distinctly uh, uh, lower in this case lower stresses are there here relative to what you get uh, out here and therefore with respect to stress uh, you are moving in a favorable direction. Yet another very interesting issue that comes up when you go to very small sizes uh, is the issue of isotropy or anisotropy. So now uh, if you actually go to uh, let us say um, a hardware store right if you go to a hardware store and you buy a sheet of uh, some metal you buy typically some you know some uh, stainless steel sheet or uh, some other sheet for uh, uh, some application at your home. Uh, if you just buy this sheet or even if you go to a uh, vessel store a utensil store you buy a, a utensil uh, if you actually look at it in the light you will see lot of patches on it okay. So, uh, even if there is no I mean this is uh, I am not talking about rust or any such thing but a good vessel if you just look at it carefully in the light and it is nicely polished you will start seeing lot of patches. Those patches are actually grains uh, typically they are grains especially in sheets you will see this very clearly uh, because it is rolled in flattened out in various directions and therefore the grains look uh, larger. So now what uh, typically happens is when you buy a sheet uh, so you have grains uh, oriented in different directions. And what is there within a grain is that you have a series of atomic planes in perfect order. So now what happens is the idea of these planes being in perfect order is that sometimes the atoms are more closely spaced along this direction and less closely spaced along this direction. Okay, so the atoms may be more closely spaced here. whereas in this direction they are less closely spaced. And that is just one aspect of it uh, to some degree that spacing is indicative of the type of bonding that is present in the material. In other words in mati many materials bonding in one direction is different from the bonding in another direction. Okay. So, uh, and even if the bonding were same in uh, you know say uh, if it just has one bond on the x direction one on the y direction and one on the z direction or two each on the x direction y direction and z direction if you go along the body diagonal the uh, situation is different. So, the position between uh, atoms is different. So, generally you are unlikely to find uh, a solid except an amorphous solid typical crystalline solids you will find some crystalline order which means the spacing in specific directions is usually different and it also means the bonding is different therefore the properties are different. So, if I take a single crystal of uh, uh, almost any material there is a good chance that in the single crystal if I measure a property from front to back right from front to back if I measure a property say anything it could be electrical conductivity it could be mechanical strength could be thermal conductivity. If I measure it from front to back the value that I get will usually be different from the value that I will get if I measure it from top to bottom or from right to left okay. So, from your right to left. So, if I, if I uh, do it that way um, depending on how that single crystal is and what kind of uh, you know atoms are there bonds are there generally in a crystalline material you are going to find that the properties are different right. However, if you buy something macroscopic from a hardware store and you bring it to your house and you make measurements generally you will find that this is not the case you will find that you take this uh, block of metal and then you measure the conductivity from top to bottom you measure the same conductivity from front to back and conductivity from right to left. So, if you do all this from your right to left if you do all this you will find generally the uh, value is the same. The reason that is the case is that when you go from top to bottom you have you do not have a single crystal you actually have a polycrystalline sample like the one that you are seeing in, uh, in, in your slide uh, and there are many crystals between the top and the bottom and each crystal is oriented randomly. Therefore, what you see as a uh, property value that you are measuring from top to bottom is an averaged value across all these single crystals from top to bottom that is the value that you are actually measuring and recording. Same will happen from left to right from uh, front to back. So, in all these cases you are seeing an averaged value of grains pointed in all different directions uh, different sized grains may be somewhat similarly sized grains, but they are all in different di uh, directions and that is why it becomes an averaged value. This is particularly useful if you are trying to put the uh, material to use in some condition where you want that averaged value. So, that is the uh, point you uh, need to remember and also it also means that when you machine the material you can sort of not worry about 
the specific position in which you are keeping the material as long as uh, you know uh, the uh, machining will get you the shape that you want right because in general the properties are going to be the same any which way you want. On the other hand if you go to a sample that is smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller in size you may reach a point where let us say the sample that you are uh, trying to machine is actually so small that it is within the scope of this grain. Let us say you are trying to machine a cylinder and let us say th this is the top view of the cylinder you are now going to machi machine a cylinder that is within this grain. Within this grain it is no longer a polycrystalline sample it is a single crystal sample uh, where there is a dramatic difference in property between this direction and this direction. So, what you got as a averaged property for a large sample of that size average property that you got for a large sample that size is not the property that you will get for a small sample that size. Okay. So, suddenly you will find that for the large sample everything was the same whether you measured it this way that way top to bottom everything the same you come to this sample here and suddenly you find that it is no longer the same you are finding something you know maybe the property is three times as strong in one direction uh, compared to the other direction and this could completely throw away your uh, I mean completely uh, disturb the kind of machinery you are trying to make or the kind of product that you are trying to make. Your product may uh, uh, let us say it is a uh, uh, let us say it is a cylinder on which something has to be loaded and you assume a certain average value of uh, strength for that material. Suddenly you find in one direction it is very weak in the only in one direction it can hold whereas when you made it in the macroscopic scale you did not care it was a cylinder you could roll it and any in any direction you could load the sample it would hold right. Uh, let us say you are making a ring you are a ring of some sort you can hold the ring this way you can hold the ring this way whatever way you hold it the uh, uh, load it will take perfectly whereas now with the smaller material you cannot load it any which way in one direction you load it it will break another direction you load it it will stay strong. So, this is something that you have to keep in mind when you go to small scale. So, this has got to do with grain structure and homogeneity uh, in let us say composition uh, and uh, so on and grain structure is this this structure that you see here is this grain structure this is a grain these are the grain boundaries. Right. So, this is a grain that you have seen and so if you go to the scale close to the grain bound uh, grain size uh, you no longer can expect this averaged property and therefore, this is called uh, as long as it is averaged and uniform across all directions it is uh, we describe it as isotropic isotropic means the properties are similar in all directions and if it is not uh, uh, you know similar in all directions then we say it is anisotropic. So, when you go down in size you are increasing the chances that your sample is anisotropic. Similarly, uh, we also have domains uh, in magnetic materials uh, let us say you are making a magnet for a uh, fan you are using an electromagnet for a fan. Uh, so, uh, uh, when you have uh, a field developing because of a coil uh, or there is a static magnetic uh, field there uh, that magnetic field is based on domains of uh, uh, the magnetic moments lining up with each other right. So, but if you go below the domain size then you are increasing the chances that the magnetic moments will not align with each other you are increasing the chances that they will start randomly uh, orienting because they do not have sufficient numbers to uh, sort of you know build on each other's uh, al uh, alignment and then get you a domain which is where all the magnetic moments are aligned. So, if you are trying to make a magnet that is very small you may run into trouble you may start with a material that is magnetic, but as you go smaller and smaller and smaller in size suddenly it will show you properties that are not exactly what you are expecting from the magnet uh, at larger scale it may behave very differently it may stop being magnetic uh, and so on. So, if you are trying to miniaturize a fan the fan works perfectly fine when it is large you miniaturize it suddenly it no longer works properly right. So, that is the problem that you have. Again another interesting problem with respect to heat and lubrication. So, these are all uh, uh, by the way th again as I keep saying this is very nice to see his talk you can uh, you can look up his talk uh, I mean uh, uh, transcripts of that talk at various places. Uh, he has just looked at a wide range of issues that you will see at uh, small scale and uh, you know consider options and issues with respect to them heat and lubrication. This is with from the context of let us say you are trying to miniaturize an internal combustion engine let us say you are trying to make an extremely tiny motor car for some demonstration purpose some some purpose you are trying to make an extremely tiny motor car. So, you have an engine which is inside which has all the shape and uh, you know features of an engine that you would see in your uh, car uh, that is a full sized car except that it is all you know 1 million times smaller let us say that is that is the case. Now, in our cars uh, in our automobiles we are always typically using some oil as a lubricant 
right. So that uh, otherwise uh, the engine will overheat and seize and so on. So uh, you have to have some lubricant. So now what happens with, with lubricants as you go down in size? What happens is relative to the size as you go down in smaller and smaller sizes, the effective viscosity of that lubricant will become higher and it with us if you take a tiny drop of that uh, uh, of that uh, lubricant and put a tiny me uh, metal, two tiny metal pieces and try to move them, uh, you will find generally find that they stick more, they do not move that easily. So uh, but there are solutions to it, you can go to uh, lower uh, viscosity oils and so you can try to mitigate this problem. But interestingly, uh, why are we actually doing this lubrication? I mean we are doing it because otherwise the parts become hot and uh, uh, you, you, you need some of this lubrication to handle all that heat and movement and so on. Interestingly when you go down in size, the heat loss from that engine is actually quite high. So in other words, uh, you are trying to uh, normally an engine this large size because of, it is, uh, because of its mass, it also has a thermal mass associated with it. Right. So, it takes certain amount of uh, you know it, will, it has to release some amount of energy to the uh, environment for it to cool down. Uh, but if you go to smaller and smaller sizes and the environment is the same, the uh, amount of mass of the engine is extremely small. So, correspondingly its thermal mass is also very small and therefore it loses heat very easily to the surroundings. It is no different than you know you keep a small uh, you know small bead, you heat one small bead and one big block of uh, metal to the same temperature and you keep it out. The small bead will cool very fast, the big bead will take a big block of metal will take a long time to cool right. So that is got to do with the thermal mass, there is so much heat inside it has all got to come to the surface and leave, when a small bead it happens very fast. Same thing large engine block, small tiny engine block, large engine block will take long time to cool, small engine block will lose heat very fast. Therefore the interesting thing is if you are making a tiny engine, you may not have an issue with lubrication because you can you probably can run the engine without any lubrication because it is just not heating up, it is not heating up so you do not need any lubrication and so uh, this issue that you have a lubricant and that you need to have a lubricant of uh, appropriate viscosity at uh, extremely small scale can actually be worked around, you no longer need it because uh, this uh, heat loss is uh, not there. Interestingly now this creates a new problem right, so we have we started off with something that is large scale we try to miniaturize it, we saw that there is a problem with respect to viscosity, we recognize that actually maybe there is no problem with respect to viscosity because heat loss is faster, but this creates a new problem. What is the new problem? In, in any engine you need to have a certain amount of heat to be present for the fuel to ignite, okay, so only then the fuel ignites. So now if the engine is losing heat very fast, the fuel will not ignite, okay, so therefore the engine will stop working. So it is not stopping to work because it is overheating, this, is, this engine is going to stop working because it is cooling too fast, the small engine and therefore you have to now work around it, you have to provide some el electronic ignition to it, only then it will start functioning, right. So this is an interesting cycle of problems that arises as you go down in scale, uh, one seems to be a problem, it actually is not a problem, then you find it creates another problem uh, and then you have to find a way to deal with it. So that is some, that process, that thought process is something that you have to uh, keep in mind. So then uh, Feynman also considers the idea that you have to uh, deal with uh, let us say making machines at the small scale. So while his talk deals with a lot of things at the small scale, he also explores the idea of what should you do if you want to make things at the small scale, okay. So that is an idea that uh, he explores. So uh, he takes this uh, broader picture of a master hand and slave hand. So this is something that uh, uh, has existed let us say in uh, nuclear industry where you are working with the materials that are uh, you know radioactive and therefore you, you cannot have uh, as easy uh, contact with the materials uh, that you are working with as you would do in an, any other uh, non-nuclear energy related laboratory. So what they would do, uh, one of the ways in which they can deal with that is to have some kind of a robotic hand uh, where uh, in another location which is not radioactive, you, you attach some things to your hand and then you try to open a bottle this robotic hand will actually uh, be elsewhere, it will go grab a bottle and do exactly the same action that you are doing. So in other words whatever you are doing with your hand, it will repeat, okay, so that uh, it will do. And uh, so an example is here, this is uh, you know macro uh, mechanical uh, kind of example uh, which you can easily make even at home as a toy uh, and this is like a mechanical version of it. So this is the, a, a real person's hand here and this is the robotic hand you can think of, it is just a block of wood with some joints and here are some threads. 
So, these are all threads. Right, each going to a different finger in your hand. So, now when you pull one finger in, it will pull the thread closer to you and that thread which let us say you have pulled this thread back closer to you and then that that will, that will pull this finger inwards or let us say this, this thread you have pulled in, it will pull this finger, uh, it will it will pull this thread in and therefore, it will curl the uh, finger. So, when you curl your index finger, the index finger of that uh, uh, robotic arm will curl. So, this is a very simple mechanical way in which you can make this slave hand. So, you can easily use this as an hand extension. So, at your home you can make this, uh, uh, this gadget very easily and let us say you have a cup of uh, water uh, in front of you, you can easily uh, curl your fingers as though you are grabbing the cup, your extended arm will grab that cup and then you can hand it off to somebody. So, this is the way you could do it. Now, uh, what fine mind says is that you know like this idea you can also consider the possibility that your hand is at a certain size and that the uh, slave hand that you are making is at a much smaller size and therefore, uh, you can go from uh, you know uh, something that you are making at your scale, uh, you will be making it at your scale, but your uh, robotic hand will make it at let us say one tenth the scale. If that robotic hand is one tenth your hand, whatever you do at your scale, the robotic hand will do at one tenth the scale. So, he uses this idea to say that you know you can uh, make machines which make copies of themselves and so uh, let us say you have a lathe, a lathe can be wired so that it makes a new lathe, but that new lathe is one tenth, uh, one fourth its size and let us say that lathe makes another lathe which is one fourth its size and so on. So, like this you can make uh, starting with some macroscopic machine, you can make a very microscopic machine and then if you have several of those, uh, you can create a factory of uh, small tiny machines. Uh, which if they are in a position where if those machines have been made in such a way that they can do some activity together, you can have this uh, set, uh, you know large collection of tiny machines which are going about doing some activity and then they create uh, you know more machines and so on. So, this idea he explores on how you can do this uh, if you go from uh, large scale to small scale and he also points out that you know uh, in terms of material, this is actually very convenient to us because if you had to make let us say 1000 uh, uh, lathes. Uh, for doing some machining, they would occupy uh, you know a very large building amount uh, if you had to uh, place them uh, in some uh, building. Whereas, if you made tiny lathes which are uh, uh, one thousandth the size of the original lathe, the thousand lathes will just occupy the size of one lathe right. So, that is the beauty of doing something at extremely small scale, the amount of material you need also will be extremely tiny, the amount of material you need will be just the amount of material you need for one lathe and uh, therefore, this is a very uh, interesting uh, direction to go in. Uh, and he says that you know if you have this large army of small machines, they can do something very constructive uh, together. So, he actually looks at again you know how you could do this physically. Uh, so, he looks at a machine called a pantograph. You know uh, in these days we have photocopy machines where uh, you put in some uh, document and it makes a copy of the document almost instantaneously. You can take photographs, you can print out your photograph. So, many such options we have readily available to us these days. Uh, if you go back uh, 60 years, 1960s and so on, they did not have such facilities. Uh, even a, a photocopy machine, um, I do not know if it was uh, really available at that uh, point in time. So, but they did have ways of making copies uh, of uh, different diagrams and not just copies, you could also have ways in which you could magnify the diagram uh, if you wanted. And so, one of those is uh, this uh, device called a pantograph, where the idea is that on that machine you will trace the original figure. So, whatever is that original figure, so let us say, um, let us say it is uh, a, a boat, some boat like that. So, you would trace this on the pantograph, you would, uh, you would take the pen of the pantograph and move it uh, along the lines of this boat it would then create a copy of this boat based on how the pantograph is designed, it would create a copy of the boat which is much bigger. So, whatever is that size, you know whatever it is designed to uh, uh, magnify to, it would make a much larger boat for you. So, I part of it is visible here, but you could make a larger boat. So, that is the idea that with which it does and the, with the manner in which it does is something like this. So, this is a pantograph and uh, so, there is one point that is fixed which is this point for example, this is a fixed point, uh, this joint is movable. Uh, this joint is movable or at least they are they can uh, slide with respect to each other this way that way and so all these joints can move. So, the idea is that you will take this as a fixed point. So, this is your fixed point point. 
with this point you will trace your original figure. If you put a pen on this point, it will create a magnified image. Okay, so so uh, if if this were moving along this direction, this would move along that direction and it would correspondingly make a larger uh, uh, image. You could do the opposite if uh, the uh, if this region was the uh, tracing the original uh, diagram, then a pen at this region would give you a uh, miniaturized image. So, so for example, I am just showing that to you here. So, this is how uh, for example, this arc has moved. So, I have traced an arc in this direction. The pen here has traced an arc which is much larger, right. So, so by uh, moving uh, uh, the uh, location A, I am getting a much larger arc from uh, location B. So, uh, you can make any any shape because the joints are all uh, you know uh, uh, flexible joints. So, you can actually get uh, you can trace any shape that you wish with uh, uh, point A and you will get a magnified image of it uh, using the pen at point B. So, that is basically what this pantograph is. So, you can see here original position and it has moved right original position is here it has moved. So, this is the pantograph uh, and so he says that you know you can actually use this kind of an idea to make something smaller. So, he talks about how you would go about making something smaller and this is an idea that he provides us with. Okay, some more interesting problems at small scales. So, what is this problem on van der Waals forces versus gravity. So, he talks about this idea that you know you are trying to fix something you are fixing a bolt to a nut in, 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 a, sm uh, in a small scale. So, when you actually do it in a macroscopic scale, so when you you know do it with your hands you have a uh, bolt and a nut and then you uh, uh, you know thread them uh, one into the other it fits. If you remove the thread you un uh, unscrew it and then it comes to the edge you remove it it will just fall right off right the bolt just falls off. So, the nut and bolt just fall apart once you remove them, but if you go to extremely tiny scales they fall apart at the large scale because gravity is there right gravity is there at the large scale and it has that much mass and so it gets attracted by gravity and it falls right off. Now, when you go to extremely tiny scales the mass is so small that uh, if you have any attractive forces I mean uh, you know chemical bonding forces uh, which are also acting between the nut and the bolt they start taking relatively higher uh, I mean relatively they start matching the value of the gravitational pull on the nut and the bolt. So, that force also exists in the large nut and bolt except that the weight of the nut and bolt is so large that it completely overwhelms the attractive forces say van der Waals forces of attraction between the various atoms in the nut and the bolt. So, the gravitational force on the nut and bolt is way larger than that of the van der Waals forces between the nut and the bolt. When you go to the very tiny scale the van der Waals forces remain the same they are uh, exactly the same value, but the gravitational uh, uh, you know uh, effect on the nut and bolt becomes extremely tiny because the mass of the nut and bolt is extremely tiny. So, they, they do not fall off as easily they are competing uh, its weight is competing against the pull from the van der Waals force and so it sort of it might uh, sort of get stuck. So, he describes that you know as though you are working with something that is sticky right it is just like putting some gum uh, on uh, some adhesive uh, on the nut and bolt and so as you uh, as you unthread it it does not come off it is still sticking if the nut and bolt are still sticking. So, it is that kind of a situation that you can have at when you go to extremely small uh, scales where you now have to look at the uh, relative values of uh, different uh, uh, you know properties. He also talks about this idea of uh, arranging something atom by atom uh, and so again this is again significant uh, you know uh, extrapolation on uh, on his part which he, which has been you know very uh, nicely uh, shown to be true in these days uh, is that uh, you know today we have this thing called an atomic force uh, microscope. AFM atomic force microscope. That does exactly this I mean you have actually a very pointed uh, tip uh, that is very small it is shown in large scale here, but extremely small uh, almost uh, to atomic dimensions you are going with this tip. And so, when you bring this close to a set of atoms 
uh, you can exert an uh, force on those atoms and people have shown experimentally that they can carefully move an atom around. So, you can uh, make a collection of atoms uh, arranged in a certain manner then you can use this atomic force microscope to actually image it. So, there is a way in which you can use this in an imaging mode. So, in that case it will show you the image of those atoms and tell you where those atoms are sitting. Then you can use it in a slightly different mode where the tip comes very close to an atom and then starts dragging the atom. So, you can drag the atom and now position it at a different location relative to where it was originally and then again change the mode go back to the original mode and then take an image of that uh, uh, set of atoms. So, today we have that capability to rearrange atom by atom. So, you can you can uh, you know really uh, think of some set of atoms in some arrangement and then sit with an atomic force microscope and within reason actually do something uh, very similar actually create that uh, collection of atoms in that uh, orientation. So, this is uh, the idea of at arranging something atom by atom which will help you again at the nano scale in some very interesting ways. So, for example, this AFM uh, when I, I spoke about it being used in imaging mode it actually does surface topology. So, if you have a surface like this it will slide along the surface and as long as it is smooth it will remain smooth then it will climb up go down slide up this slide down this go up and down as it is moving in this direction. So, then it will record that it has moved straight it has moved up it has come down moved up come down. So, it, it keeps track of x y and z locations of this tip the microscope physically moves a sharp tip on a surface and then as the tip goes down it notes that the z value has gone down then tip goes up knows z x z value has gone up and so on. So, x y direction it already knows because it is moving the tip accordingly z direction it picks up the information and so it gives you a surface uh, you know topology so to speak of that sample. So, all the hills and valleys of that sample are nicely uh, captured by it and so if there are atoms it can actually show you the you know it will go up over and above uh, the atoms and give you some some approximate idea of how those atoms look. So, this is how the AFM works and using this you could arrange things atom by atom and then uh, you can uh, uh, create something that is interesting. Okay, and uh, one final point that he makes uh, is that you know one of the advantages of when you of doing this at extremely small scale is that you know when you do at large scale if you want to make an exact copy of something you start with some object and you want to make an exact copy of it your accuracy has to be po some 0.000001 uh, percent accuracy only then you can get something that is uh, you know an exact copy of the original. Interestingly when you go down to atomic scale if you are trying to make an exact copy of 10 atoms you have here one uh, let us see a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 atoms are here. So, I have 10 atoms uh, here if I want to make an exact copy of these 10 atoms right. So, what do I need I it when I say an exact copy it means I should not have 9 atoms I should not have 11 atoms I should have exactly 10 atoms. So, for this I should have more than 9 less than 11. So, even if I get, get 9 and a half I am at uh, I, I cannot have 9 and a half atoms if I cross 9 I will reach 10 I cannot have 10 and a half uh, if I cross 10 I will have 11. So, if I drop below 10 and a half I am at 10. So, essentially I have to be accurate only with respect to about half an atom because half an atom will not exist if, if I am anything better than half an atom accuracy naturally one full atom will be there right. So, that means out of uh, 10 atoms I need to have only uh, you know uh, half an atom uh, uh, accuracy which is 5 percent accuracy. If I have 5 10 percent accuracy is one atom 5 percent accuracy is half an atom. If I am better than 5 percent accuracy anything more than 5 uh, uh, percent accuracy uh, I am uh, uh, around 5 percent accuracy I will get this uh, 10 atom uh, uh, you know uh, sample done correctly. So, therefore, uh, suddenly it is actually easier in some ways to do an exact copy at an atomic level right. So, this is again another thing that uh, uh, he highlights. Okay, so, uh, in summary uh, today we looked at the other aspects of the talk that Feynman gave uh, again uh, it is a 1959 talk uh, and you can see through what we discussed today a variety of issues uh, he has highlighted uh, where uh, sitting in uh, 1959 he could uh, think so far forward in a field that did not exist in a field that nobody had uh, spent enough time on uh, he could think of such a wide range of issues uh, that may be there and such a wide range of possibilities uh, such a wide range of uh, you know concepts and uh, uh, ways in which you can address those uh, concepts and utilize those concepts and uh, what beautiful things uh, we might have uh, available to us if we went down that path. Uh, today uh, in nanotechnology uh, in, in, in all the science that happens behind nanotechnology all the products that we have 
with respect to nanotechnology. In many ways, we are doing exactly what uh, uh, Feynman had very beautifully put, put out in his uh, 1959 talk. So, he gets a lot of credit for this uh, and as you can see from what we discussed in the last class and this class, uh, it is very justifiable. I mean, it is very nice. Uh, it is not simply that some famous person said something. If, if you sit and analyze what, what all he said, uh, it certainly uh, sounds uh, so clear uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, with so much foresight, uh, he has managed to say uh, these things. So, that is the reason why we have uh, so many people referring to his talk as the sort of this, uh, you know, philosophical start of uh, nanotechnology and I think that is an extremely justified position to take. So, uh, with this, we will conclude this class. Uh, we will look at new topics later. Thank you.